Okay, let's start section 3.6. So this is a summary of curve sketching, basically uh, <clears throat> graphing, right? So we're gonna we're gonna learn uh, use the techniques that we learned in uh, this chapter so far to help us graph some functions. Um, and so uh, obviously you already know how to graph functions. Um, you can make a table of x and y values and plot the points and connect the dots, right? Um, but there's other techniques you can use. For, so for example, which, which x values do you pick? Well, you can pick x equals 0 to get the, um, to get the y-intercept, and then you can plug in, say, uh, y equals 0 to find the x-intercepts, right? So obviously, um, <clears throat> finding the intercepts um, is a good way to start, right? At least that gives you some points to deal with. Um, you can also look at uh, symmetries. Uh, so for example, for odd functions, you're going to have symmetry with respect to the origin. And for even functions, you'll have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Um, right? So that doesn't happen often, but it's, it's something to consider. Domain and range. Uh, well, obviously, if you have a function where negative values are not in the domain, then there's no reason to even plug in negative values for x uh, into the function. Um, you know, so whatever the domain is, the domain might just be numbers between, you know, real numbers between 0 and 2. Then the values of x you would pick are rather limited, right? You can pick 0, 1, and 2, and maybe 1.5 or 0 0.2 or things like that, right? Um, and then vertical asymptotes, right? Finding the vertical asymptotes, you should know how to do that. And, well, finding horizontal asymptotes for rational functions, you knew how to do that in pre-calculus. Um, and now we just learned a more powerful way of doing it using limits uh, approaching infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so, so these are things we're, you know, already aware of and we should already be doing whenever we're confronted with graphing a function. Um, but now we can look at um, other, other techniques um, using calculus. Uh, continuity, where is the function continuous, right? So somewhat related to the domain in the sense that um, a function, you know, will be continuous, uh, not necessarily on its entire domain, but if a point is not in the domain, then it's not continuous there. Same thing with differentiable, right? Um, so you can be, uh, you can be continuous but not differentiable, um, but if you're differentiable, you're automatically continuous, okay? Um, and then uh, relative extrema, so that's your relative maximums and relative minimums. Basically, oh, let me change this so we can see it here. Um, so either something like this or like this would be relative maximum. Or if you have something like this or like this, you have a relative minimum, right? Um, and then, you know, more advanced concavity, is it, you know, is it concave up? This is concave up. This is concave down. Here I kind of did it reverse, right? This would be concave up. This would be concave down. This would be concave down. Over here, you're concave up. Uh, Oh, I, you know what? I take that back. This is concave up. This is also concave up. This is concave down. This is also concave down. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is all concave up here. Right? This is still concave up. Right? It would continue this way. And this is concave down. Right? Okay. Uh, inflection points. So that's where it changes concavity. So here we don't have any inflection points, but you have something like this. And right around here, you have your inflection point. It's going to abbreviate. Um, and asymptote, well, we already talked about asymptotes. Um, but obviously, using limits at infinity, you can find horizontal asymptotes that way. Whereas we didn't have that concept in, in your pre-calculus class. So, uh, yep, so these are just things to consider. So let's just get right into it. Let's do our first example. Example one. Um, so we're just going to graph. Sorry. Function f of x equals 
Let's start with x to the 4 minus 4x to the 3 plus 16x minus 4. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, so this is just a polynomial function. And in fact, you've, you've graphed these before. Um, but probably not finding the relative maximum and minimum, um, unless you use your calculator to do that. Um, but we're going to use calculus to do that. Okay, so what's the, the first thing to consider? Um, well, intercepts. Obviously, we can find the y-intercept pretty easily. Just plug in 0, and we get negative 4. So there's one point on the graph, right? 0, negative 4. Try that again. 0, negative 4. What about the x-intercepts? Well, that's that's a little bit trickier um, because here we have to solve this equation and I don't think we're going to be able to do it um, very easily. So why don't we hold off on that? Or, well, you could always just use your calculator to find the x and y-intercepts. But of course, the best way to do that is to graph it and we don't want to we don't want to do it. We want to graph this by hand, not using our calculators. Um, of course, you know, once we graph it, you can use your calculator to check. Symmetry, I don't think so. You can check that this is not an even function. This is not an odd function. Um, so there's no symmetry here. I mean, there might be, there might be symmetry, for example, about, say, an inflection point. But um, uh, let's not get into that. Um, there's no symmetry with the origin or the y-axis, and that's, that's all we're looking for here. Domain, of course, that's just all real numbers. Range, that's a little trickier to find. In fact, let's, let's hold off on the range. Um, in fact, the easiest way to find the range um, is to actually look at the graph. So, right, so to find the domain, you should know how to do that. To find the range, you get that after you do the graph is usually the easiest way. Okay. Okay. Um, vertical asymptotes, nope. Horizontal asymptotes, no. Right. So no asymptotes at all. Um, maybe I should elaborate. Obviously, the denominator is 1. The denominator will never be 0. So for rational functions, you only get vertical asymptotes when you have a non-zero denominator. Or, or a, sorry, a denominator that's just not equal to any constant, right? So you have to have some form of some function of x in the denominator. That doesn't happen here, right? And for horizontal asymptotes, if you let x go to infinity, y will go to infinity. If you let x go to negative infinity, um, y will also go to infinity. So the limit as x goes to, I'll say, plus or minus infinity for this function, x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 16x minus 4. Um, this is just going to be infinity for both both sides. So no, no horizontal asymptote either. All right, continuity. So this is going to be continuous everywhere on its domain. It's also differentiable everywhere on its domain. So, um, so that's, it, in other words, it's, when we graph it, it's going to be a nice smooth looking curve. So now we get to the, the real important questions. What are, where do we find the maximums and minimums, right? The relative or local maximums and minimums, right? So yeah, so that's, that's the key thing here, right? So you do the usual thing, right? You're going to find the critical numbers, critical numbers. And we do that by finding the derivative. So 4x cubed minus, oops, minus 12x squared, x squared plus 16. Okay, and where does that equal 0? Uh, so this is, ooh, this is interesting. This is a cubic equation. Um, so let's see. We, I know we can factor out a 4. Uh, 3x squared plus 4. And yeah, this is not quadratic. So this is this is going to be an interesting equation to try to solve. Um, 
Yeah, it's not obvious to me what the solutions of this are. Um, well, think about it for a second. Actually, there's, there's one obvious solution here. I, in my opinion, it's obvious. If it's not obvious, um, you know, it's take out a calculator and, and find the x-intercept. Um, so, so as a first step, I would always try x equals 1. And that doesn't work because 1 plus 4 is 5. 5 minus 3 is 2. So we x equals 1 doesn't work. But then, it took me a second, but I tried negative 1. And that actually works because you get negative 1 cubed is negative 1, minus 3 is negative 4, plus 4 is 0. So, so there's 1 already. Um, so this has two other, uh, two other solutions, and you get that by doing the usual synthetic division. So um, just to remind you, here's the setup. Remember, this is x cubed minus 3x squared plus 0x. That's why we need a 0 here and then the 4. So, so 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 plus negative 1, I'm uh, sorry, 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4. 0 plus 4 is 4. 4 times negative 4 is negative 4. And 4 minus 4 is 0. So this then factors the following way. So you're just going to get 4 times x plus 1, right? So that's, when you add 1 to both sides, you get x plus 1 equals 0. And then these are the coefficients of the other factors. So you're going to get 1x squared minus 4x plus 4. And, well, that's nice because I recognize this as a perfect square. So this is just x plus 1 times x minus 2 squared, All right? So again, 4 is just the leading coefficient. Uh, that's not a 0. You get zeros of negative 1 and positive 2, All right? So remember, these are critical numbers, right? So these are the only two critical numbers, All right? And uh, what do we do with critical numbers? Well. Uh, we want to determine whether they're maximums or minimums, or, or neither, right? And so we can use the first derivative test, um, or the second derivative test. Uh, either way works. I'm just going to quickly use the first derivative test, because we already took the first derivative. And in fact, I'm going to use this version of the first derivative. It's very easy to plug in numbers in here. So if you plug in, well, let's plug in 0 first. If you plug in 0, you just get 4 times 1 times 4, which is 16, which is positive. Um, if you plug in, let's say, 3, um, you'll get a positive times a positive times a positive, so that's also positive. And if you plug in negative 2, you're going to get uh, a positive times a negative times a positive, which is negative. All right, so that's the sign chart. In other words, the function, the original function, this, is going to be decreasing uh, between negative infinity and negative 1 increasing from negative 1 to infinity. Um, well, maybe I should, we should note that, right? So f is going to be decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative 1 and increasing everywhere else from negative 1 to infinity. Um, it right, including it too, because it's that that well, we'll see later. I think that's that probably will be our inflection point. Okay, so uh, so that's going to tell us where our maximums and minimums are. Remember, if you're going from decreasing to increasing, you have a minimum, and this is increasing to increasing, so this is neither a minimum nor a maximum. Okay, so we only have one minimum, so we have a relative minimum at x equals negative 1, y equals, so can we do this quickly here? So this is going to be 1 plus 4 is 5. 5 minus 4 is 1, and then 1 minus 16 is negative 15. Okay. 
Um, yep, again, you can also just use your calculator. All right, so one relative minimum, and of course, neither at, uh, at x equals 2, because it's increasing and then increasing. So that's the first derivative test, right? Um, and again, the, the second derivative test uh, will probably tell you the same thing, but uh, why bother? Uh, actually, I take that back, right? If we want to know concavity here, uh, we're going to need a second derivative anyway. So why don't we take the second derivative, and let's see what we get here. Um, so I'm going to use this version here, just using the usual rules here. We get 12x squared. Uh, minus 24x plus 0. 16 is a constant. So this is the second derivative. Um, and in fact, you can factor out the 12x, leaving you with just x minus 2. Um, and what do we want? If we want inflection points, that's possibly where this equals 0. Um, yep. Yeah. So we get a uh, possible, po again, I say possible, um, inflection points at x equals 0, and then again at x equals 2. Okay, and how do we know if they are inflection points? Well, we do the same thing that we did with the first derivative. We're going to do with the second derivative. So here we have 0 and 2 as our dividing points. So we know that's where the second derivative is 0. I should have mentioned that here first derivative was 0. Um, and, well, if you plug in a negative number, you get a negative times a negative, which is positive. If you plug in 1, you get 12 times negative 1, you get negative 12. And if you plug in 3, you get a positive times a positive, which is positive. Right. I know I did that fast, but just, you know, you can plug in each of these numbers or into the second derivative um, or just use the signs. One second. Okay, so what what can we what do we know from this? We know that the function is right, f is going to be concave up on from negative infinity to zero, and then from two to infinity, and then it'll be concave down uh, between zero and two. So yes, both 0 and 2 are inflection points. So I'm going to have to scroll down a little bit here. Um, scroll down a lot. And so we have uh, x equals 0. Was it 4? Negative 4. Yep, so that was also the y-intercept. But it also turns out to be an inflection point. And also when x is 2, y is going to be Oh, can I do this in my head? Um, let's see. So 2 to the 4th is 16 minus uh, 2 to the 5th, which is 32. So that's negative 16. And then 16 times 2 is positive 32. So now we're back to positive 16 minus 4 is 12. So we have an inflection point at, oops, sorry, 212. This pen is not working, right? 12. Okay. So, yep, yeah, let's kind of highlight the important things. We have a relative minimum, and then we have these two inflection points. Okay. Um, so, we already said there's no asymptote. So, I think this is really all we have to go on here. Um, can we graph the function with just this information? Well, maybe maybe a crude graph, but uh, uh, it might be enough. So again, I'm going to have a very hard time graphing here. Um, so, well, see, it's, it's hard to draw a vertical line here, but let me do my best. Oh, see, this is not going to work. Um, all right, hang on a second. Okay, uh, so yeah, I managed to get this little grid here. That might help me graph this a little better. Um, so hang on a second. Uh, 
okay, so this should, uh, yeah, it's always good to have graph paper. Um, so, so we have the relative minimum at negative 1, negative 15. Now, obviously, negative 15 is off the scale here. So, uh, may, you know, maybe I shouldn't have used these uh, y values here. So I'll tell you what, instead of this being 1, um, yeah, let's just, I, I think we can do this. Let's just make it 2, right? And this will be 4, this will be 6, and so on. So I'm just going to change the y scale a little bit here. Um, so, so that makes negative 15 way down here. So this would be 7.5, right? So this would be negative 15 right there. Uh, 0, negative 4 would be up oh, right here. 2, 12 would be right here. All right. So what do we know about this point? It's a relative minimum. So we know the graph, at least vaguely, looks like this. And then let me try that again. Because we know we're going to have to go through 4. So this is going to be pretty steep here. All right. What happens at 212? Well, it's an inflection point. It's not a minimum. It's not a maximum, right? So it's going to look like that. And then let me try connecting these. Well, yeah, it's very steep. This pen not used to it so all right that's as good as it's going to get all right very sloppy but you get the idea um, now i'm hesitating here because this this obviously keeps going up but i don't know exactly where go where you have an x-intercept here um, so i guess we could do a couple things here if we want to set the original Oops, the original equation equal to zero here. Um, I mean, I, I guess we're just going to either estimate it or not worry about it in the graph here. So I'm probably not going to get the, the correct x-intercept, but that's fine. I'm much more worried do you have the correct you know, inflection point here and the correct relative minimum. Of course, it doesn't go back on itself. Okay, I did it again, right? It just keeps going up forever. Okay, something like that. So, again, a very sloppy graph, but um, my writing utensil here is not very precise. So, um, but that's the idea for graphing um, a function, uh, in this case, a polynomial. So, in fact, it might look better if I just do it over here, right? So basically, oops, the graph would look something like this. All right. So this point here being the relative minimum, negative 1, negative 15, the inflection point here being 212. Um, and somewhere in here, of course, is the y-intercept. Obviously, I didn't, drew, didn't draw the x and y axes because it's hard to draw a vertical line. Okay. Well, either way, this gives you the, the basic idea. Um, so that's our first example. Um, so I guess we'll try to do one more, um, and then we'll move on to the next section, which is uh, optimization, and that's going to be a bit more challenging. Um, so... Um, trying to figure out what the next example should be. Um, okay, so here's one. Um, okay. So this will be, I'll call it g of x. This will be x squared squared plus 4x plus 13, all over x plus 2. Okay, so not a polynomial. This is a rational function, right? 
And so this, that's, that's a 4. So already we can tell that this is going to have a vertical asymptote, right? Wherever the denominator is 0, you get a vertical asymptote. Well, OK, the denominator is 0, and it's pretty clear the numerator will not be 0 with negative 2. The numerator uh, will not be 0 here for ne negative 2. So that means we do have a vertical asymptote, not a whole at x equals negative 2. OK, so that's just where the denominator is 0. Um, do we have any horizontal asymptotes? Mm, nope, none. So the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. In other words, if you just take the limit as x goes to infinity of this function, you just get infinity, not a number. So no horizontal asymptotes, sorry, horizontal asymptotes. OK, so none. Um, trying to remember, yes, intercepts. Um, well, again, the y-intercept is very easy. You just plug in 0, you get 13 over 2, which is 6 and a half. Um, horizontal, uh, horizontal uh, sorry, x-intercepts. Um, so I can look at this and, and basically tell you that uh, there aren't going to be any uh, x-intercepts. Um, so how do I know that? I'm looking at, when you set the numerator equal to 0, you get no real solutions. Um, because you're going to get the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So that's going to be 16 minus 52, which is going to be negative. So... So no real solutions means no x-intercepts. So that's interesting, right? Um, all right, what's next? Um, domain and range. So the domain, of course, is all real numbers except negative 2. Oh, we, never, we never did the range for this function. So let me very quickly go back to the first example here. How can we find the range? Well, we have the minimum value of negative 15, and then it just goes up from there. So the range is just all real numbers greater than or equal to negative 15. Um, so that, again, I didn't ask for that specifically, but remember, domain and range, after you get the graph, it's pretty clear to figure out the, the range, the y values from there. Um, OK, back to this problem here. Um, no x-intercepts, and again, we're not going to worry about the range yet. That comes later. So now we use calculus, and we find, again, the maximums and minimums. And uh, to do that, we need the critical numbers. And so to do that, we need the derivative, first derivative in this case. So we can use the usual quotient rule, low d high minus high d low. Derivative of the numerator is 2x plus 4. Minus numerator times the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of the denominator is just 1 times the numerator. And then all over the denominator squared. So can we clean this up a little bit? Um, I guess, yeah, let's, let's multiply this out. I, this is actually just 2 times x plus 2 squared, but I don't think that's going to help here. So... Um, so we get 2x squared plus 4x plus 4x is 8x, and then plus 8. And then minus x squared minus 4x minus 13. Oops, sorry, that's a 2. And then this should simplify to x squared plus 4x, and then 8 minus 13 is negative Okay, so, um, right, so where is this, this equal 0? When the numerator is 0, so we just have to, to find the critical numbers. We just set this equal to 0, and I'm hoping this is factorable. I think it is. If we do x minus 5 times x plus plus 1, that would be positive 4. So I think we want a positive 5 and a negative 1 to add up to positive 4, and 5 times negative 1 is negative 5, right? 
So we get two critical numbers, negative 5 and positive 1. Now, don't forget that to find the critical numbers, you also have to figure out where this does not exist, and it does not exist at x equals negative 2. Is that a critical number? You would think that, except remember, it's not in the domain, right? It's a vertical asymptote here. Um, so if, it's, if it doesn't exist for the original function, uh, it can't be a point on the graph, right? At x equals negative 2, you don't get a point. So, so yes, technically negative 2 is not a critical number because it's a vertical asymptote. Um, however, when we do the first derivative test here, we mark off the critical numbers, negative 5 and, and positive 1, it is also very beneficial if you, if you mark off the negative 2. Not as a critical number, right? So remember, the first derivative will be 0 at negative 5 and 0 at 1. However, it will be undefined at negative 2. Right? But it's important to include this point um, when you're doing the sign chart here because uh, the, this, the sign could change uh, from, uh, at negative 2. In other words, it could be negative, then positive, or positive, then negative. Um, I have a feeling in this case it won't change, but you never know when it does, and so you have to be aware that it could. So I'm going to quickly put in the, the numbers here. Um, notice the denominator is always positive, so it just depends on the signs of the numerator. And when you plug in a negative 6, you get a negative times a negative, so that's positive. If you plug in, let's say, negative 3, you get a positive times a negative, which is negative. If you plug in 0, Again, positive times negative is negative, so, yep, the sign did not change across the asymptote, but um, in other problems it will. So, um, so if you didn't mark off the negative 2, you got lucky, because it's negative in both places. Um, but it, it doesn't have to be. So if you plug in a positive number here, say 2, uh, you get a positive times a positive, which is back to positive. Okay. So, yep, you're going to get a relative maximum at negative 5 and a relative minimum at 1. Obviously, even if the sign did change here, this would not be a ma maximum or minimum because it's an asymptote. So just be aware of that. Okay, so, yep, we have a maximum at negative 5. And, oh, we have to plug into the original function, right? Um, so that's going to be 25 minus 20 is 5. 5 plus 13, 5 plus 13 is 18, and then 18 divided by negative 3, 18 divided by negative 3 is negative 6. Um, wait, 18 divided by negative 3. Yeah, I think that's right, but don't, don't hold me to that yet. Um, if it's wrong, I'll see if I can fix it. Uh, so what happens when you plug in 1? You get 1 plus 4 is 5. 5 plus 13 is again 18. Um, and then divided by 3. So 18 divided by 3 is positive 6. Huh. Um, yeah, I guess that's it then. I guess that's it. Uh, okay, so 1 maximum, 1 minimum. All right, what about uh, inflection points? Are there any inflection points? Well, you need the second derivative for that, and this is where it gets to be a bit of a pain. So here's the first derivative. We apply the quotient rule again to get the second derivative. Um, so I guess we might as well do that. It's one big fraction. Now let's do the denominator squared. Well, when you square a square, you get to the power 4. So x plus squared squared is x plus, sorry, x plus 2 squared squared is x plus 2 to the 4th. All right, so low d high minus high d low again. So x plus 2 squared, it's the denominator times the derivative of the numerator is just 2x plus 4 uh, minus the numerator. times the derivative of the denominator. So what's the derivative of x plus 2 squared? So you get 2 times x plus 2 to the 1 times the derivative of x plus 2, which is 1. Yep. Don't forget the chain rule, obviously, because it's just 
the derivative is one here, it's not gonna matter, but it might in other problems. So you get this big mess here. Now, unlike here, instead of multiplying all this out, which you could do, although I would discourage you from doing it, notice that we do have a common factor here of x plus two and x plus two here, although it's squared here, right? So I'm gonna factor out the x plus two. Oops. And notice one of them is gonna cancel with the denominator. So what are we left with? We're left with two x plus four. Oh, wait a minute. We still have another x plus two here because this was squared. So you're gonna get x plus two times two x minus four. Uh, oh, sorry, 2x plus 4. That's a plus, yeah. And then minus, so if you factor out the x plus 2 here, you just get 2 times x squared. Um, you get 2 times negative 4x, which is negative 8x. And you get 2 times positive 5, which is positive 10. All over the denominator squared. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, all over x plus 2 to the 4th. We did that already. x plus 2 to the 4th. Okay, so everyone okay so far? Great. So now I think we need to simplify what's in the, the brackets here. So let's do that way down here. So, oh, notice that one of these x plus 2s cancels. So this 4 now becomes a 3. Um, so the denominator will just be x plus 2 to the third. Uh, and all of this mess, well, when you FOIL this out, you get 2x squared plus 4x plus 4x is plus 8x plus 8. Feels like we did that already. And then when you subtract, you get 2x squared minus 2x squared. So that adds up to 0. You get 8x minus 8x. Wow, I didn't expect that, but that adds up to 0. And you just get 8 plus 10, which is 18. Huh. So that simplified quite a bit. Um, so much so that I'm doubting myself whether I did all the arithmetic right here. But um, 4x plus 4x is 8x. And then 2 times 4 is 8. Um, yeah, it looks right. Looks correct. OK, so this is the second derivative. So, um, yeah, so where does this equal zero? Well, it doesn't, right? However, notice the denominator could be zero at x equals negative two. So when you do your sign chart for the second derivative, um, you're gonna go from, a, I think, a negative to a positive, right? If you plug in, say, negative three, you get a negative. And if you plug in anything positive, uh, bigger than negative two, you get a positive divided by positive. So, yep, what happens at negative two? You change concavity, right? You're going from concave down to concave up, right? So from negative infinity to negative two, you're concave down. Oops, concave down. And then from negative two to infinity, you're concave up. And so you might say, well, then at negative two, you have an inflection point, right? Because that's where it's where it changes concavity. Uh, so be careful, right? Is this an inflection point? What does it need to be to be a point? You need an x and a y. So if I plug in negative 2 into my original function here, so what is g of negative 2? Well, it's some number, let's see, 4 minus 8, uh, negative 4 plus 13 is 9. 9 divided by negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Yeah, 9 divided by 0 is undefined. So it's not a point. There are no inflection points here, right? So no inflect, oops, no inflection points. So just because it changes concavity doesn't make it an inflection point. So notice that it changes concavity at x equals negative 2. Earlier we said that it's a vertical asymptote. So yes, it will change concavity Oops, at the vertical asymptote here. But it's not an inflection point. OK, okay. Uh, so moving, moving right along here, um, I, actually, I think that's all we need 
uh, we found that the vertical asymptotes, um, there's no horizontal asymptotes. We know that because the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. But that's not the whole story, right? There's, you can have asymptotes that are neither vertical nor horizontal, right? Those are, those are your slant asymptotes. So, um, oh, I'm running out of space here. Well, let me see. I, I think I have enough space to do the slant asymptotes. Um, some books call this an oblique asymptote. I'm just going to call it a slant asymptote. So how do you find the slant asymptotes? You do the division here, right? So we're going to divide x plus 2 into x, uh, x, well, x squared plus 4x plus 13 divided by x plus 2. Um, again, forgive the sloppiness here. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just use synthetic division. So 1, 4, 13, 13. Uh, yep, this should be pretty quick. 1 plus 0 is 1. Negative 1 times, or 1 times negative 2, rather, is negative 2. 4 plus negative 2 is 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. And 13 minus 4 is 9. So this becomes the remainder. That means this is just 1x plus 2 plus 9 over x plus 2. Okay, so what that means is as x is getting bigger, this fraction here is getting smaller, right? This is going to 0. So, so x will go to infinity, but your, your slant asymptote here is just y equals x plus 2. In other words, ignore the fractional part because that goes to 0. Right? So this is your slant asymptote. Okay, um, so I think we have all the information we need here um, to be able to get a somewhat decent looking graph, I hope. Um, so, so I'm going to graph this again, just hang on for just a second. Okay, I'm back. So I'm going to graph this function here, or at least I'm going to try to. This, again, this is not going to be easy for me, but I'm going to do my best. All right, so we know we have a maximum at negative 5, negative 6. So here's negative 5, negative 6. Uh, oops, hang on. So right here is our relative maximum and a minimum at 1, 6. So way up here. Oh, I missed a little. Oops, I erased them both. All right, negative 5, negative 6, right here. And then 1, 6. Yep, 1, 6. So right about here. Uh, what else do we know? We have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. So here's negative 2. Um, So this is our vertical asymptotes. Again, forgive the sloppiness. All right, close enough. And so th this is going to be pretty tough to do here. Um, uh, so the this is remember this is a minimum. So so it's going to look something like this. Okay, and then same thing here. All right, this is a maximum. So it's going to look something like this. All right. Um, yeah. Again, I should have changed my scale because you, the the important piece of the of the of the graph here is below this. So this is just going to keep going down here, and this is going to keep going, just like up here. And in particular, if you scroll down all the way down here, we found that the slant asymptote is y equals x plus 2. So y equals x plus 2 uh, looks like this. Draw a dotted line, dashed line, like that. Oops, I missed a little bit. 
So we're not, we're not going to get to see the fact that this graph actually approaches that line. And the same thing here. Maybe this should look a little more like this rather than like that. Um, all right. So that's, I can't erase with this, so you'll just have to, uh, you know, fix it, fix it later, I guess. Uh, so that's the basic shape of this graph here. Um, again, that's that's yeah, this graph here. So g of x equals x squared plus four x plus thirteen, all over x plus two. Sloppy, yes, but it's, it's the best I can do. Um, so I hope, I hope when you do this on pencil and paper, it looks a little bit neater than this. Um, but again, this is just to give you the idea. So when you're graphing something, these are the things you worry about. In particular, the relative maximum and minimum and inflection points. Uh, to go back to this, you'll notice there are no inflection points here. This is indeed concave down um, in this area here, right? And it's concave up over here. But at x equals negative 2, the vertical asymptote here, uh, there's no inflection point. It just changes concavity as it, as it uh, passes through the vertical asymptote, if you will. OK, uh, so I hope these two examples are, are good enough. Obviously, they're going to be s some more difficult involving square roots and things like that. But this should at least give you the basic idea. Um, when you do have square roots, of course, you have to worry more about the domain. Um, and things like that. So um, so that should do it for 3.6. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, feel free to ask questions.